Welcome back, second lecture in 205 CDE, second of 24 lectures, no, yeah, no, 20 lectures, so we're getting there. Um, the first lecture, if you remember, from last week was an introduction to the course and I made you start thinking about your website, the sort of thing you want to be build, designing and building. Now hopefully this week you've done your first lab. Okay, so you've had your lab, you've uh, done the Wayback Engine, you've pulled off some old images, you've had a look at how technology's evolved, and you've started to mock up some site ideas, so to block out some sites, so you can see how websites are designed and built. So hopefully by this stage you know what you're doing, you've got some ideas, you've, you, um, you're raring to go, and the assignment for this, this first assignment is due in in three weeks' time. Yeah, three weeks' time, so you haven't got a lot of time to spare. But if you work through the labs week by week, you'll be doing the assignment as you go. Okay, so please don't be tempted to leave the labs early, just so you can get, a, get to lunch five minutes, you know, ten minutes early. If you stick to the labs, use the help and support you get there, you should find things much easier. Now, who was in the lab that got cancelled the first week? Now, Ted, you should have been there this week. Was, was it okay, much better this week? Yeah, but it was still chaos. Well, of course it's chaos, that's called a lab. <laughs> what happened? Because you had a problem with the SQL or whatever, trying to get into SQL? That wasn't chaos, that was just forward planning, mate. That was, we don't need that for about another five weeks. Yeah. If you haven't got your login, tell the tutor. Now, the list you gave me, half the people in the list already had logins, they just hadn't typed them in properly. They were there, they just hadn't typed them. So be, just check your login details. We don't need the login details until the second assignment. So I'm doing this early to make sure that everyone's got set up in plenty of time. So don't worry too much if you're not set up immediately. Um, I've been, I get a regular trickle of names being sent to me to set new accounts up, and I'm kind of putting them together in a spreadsheet and then bulk generating accounts. So by your next lab, you should have the account. Again, if you haven't, let the tutor know and we'll go through the process again, right? So don't worry too much about that. Okay, we're just planning a long way ahead. So we're gonna talk about design now, website design. Okay, and the important thing about your website is you can't, separ you, you can't separate the design from the functionality. You can't work on functionality and then kind of stick a design over the top of it. It doesn't work that way. You've got to think about the two together. Okay, so famous quote is design is not what it looks like and feels like, it's how it works. So your design is such an intrinsic part of your website, you can, it's not something you can bolt on afterwards. So we're going to spend today's session looking at website design. And the first thing we have to think about is, if we're going to design a website to make it work well, what are we actually going to do with our website? So I've pulled together a few lists of things we do with websites. And what you want to do is think about how these relate to your project, to your website you're designing, <coughs> and make sure that whatever you design and build supports this particular, this particular use. So the first thing is finding a factor object. Sites like Wikipedia, um, eBay, for instance, they're finding things, aren't they? So you have to have things like search, search boxes, you have to have lists of search results, you have to have displays, a summary of items to be displayed. So if you think about what you're using the site for, that kind of tells you what pages you're going to need within the site. The second thing is learning something. <clears throat> Some sites are all about learning. So for that one, you might want to ask questions, some way of having a forum where you can ask questions about something, somewhere you can watch videos maybe, somewhere where you can upload things. Performing a transaction, making a payment, Amazon, eBay, doing something. Do you know, do you know what I mean by transaction? Yeah, transaction. It doesn't have to be money, it's, it's, it's where you go through a step-by-step -step process. So for example, on Amazon, when you buy something, there's that wizard, isn't it, that takes you through step one, step two, step three, step four. And the design of the payment system in Amazon it is designed to take you through those steps of the payment. So, so it's really important that this the design is built into your website. Controlling or monitoring something. There's some good sites out there for controlling things, monitoring things. I mean, there's, uh, there's sites out there which allow you to capture data, digital data, put it online, temperature data and so on, share the information. Um, creating something. I mean, Google Drive, which I'm using here to do the presentation, is a website, yeah, but it's designed to build something. You can get websites to create graphics. 
can't you? you can you, when you go on to the third year 305 we've got a website which is for something called yahoo pipes where you plug things together and build an interface so oh and final thing chatting to other people you know classic social media stuff you know facebook twitter and so on so you have to understand why the person's using your website before you can design your website it's fundamental or being entertained that's obvious isn't it okay right <coughs> so you might want to think about some of these questions when you're designing your website and you even though it's not you're not asked for this particular bit of information in your assignment it's worth putting it in if you can think through the process because it will simplify the other steps you're working on first part of research is what is the user's goal in using your website what is the end goal if it's, it's some form of review site isn't it but that's so vague and ephemeral it could be anything couldn't it if it's um, um i don't know um go on your web website moodle the goal in using moodle is to learn things isn't it to share information and to learn things the goal for ebay is to buy and sell things if you establish your goal the rest of your website will build on that. Okay, so once you've worked out what the goal is that you're trying to achieve, or the users are trying to achieve, you should be able to break it down into steps. What are the steps? What's the typical flow that people are going to go through when they use your site? And in the fourth session, I've got planned for you, so not next week, but the week after, we're going to spend a whole session on building site maps and navigation. And if you get this bit right, it'll simplify that, that fourth session, getting your navigation built properly. <coughs> the languages, I don't mean a sort of um, a language language. I don't mean like English or French or German or Portuguese or whatever. I mean, what terminology are you going to be using? Shopping cart, for instance, that's part of language of e-commerce, isn't it? Shopping cart, checkout. If you're building things, uh, design, export, these are terms that you associate with design based, you know, designing websites. If you're dealing with review sites, rating, these are keywords, aren't they? Important language. Rating, review, comments, yeah, there's all sorts of keywords that you relate, you can relate to your particular uh, website. This is one of the reasons I asked you to carry out some research last week into existing sites is people are accustomed to working in certain ways. If you're looking at a game site like IGN, there's certain functionality in those sites, isn't there? And there's certain approaches that people use when they're dealing with those sites. There's things people expect to see, basically. And if they're not there, they're going to get very confused. So they already have some skill in using similar sites like forums and chat rooms and reading reviews and so on. So let's use some of that. With a review, you expect to see the score at the top, don't you, somewhere? If you think about the game sites, you want to see the, the review before you dive into the article. So don't put the review at the bottom. People are accustomed to seeing things a certain way and working in certain ways. And a good example in point is if you look at uh, news websites like uh, Guardian, Independent, Times, Daily Mail and so on, they all have comment sections, don't they, at the bottom of the articles. What about the BBC news? Who's watched the, looks at the BBC News website? Where are the comments? Don't any of them look like yeah, and not even they've got a particular label for it, haven't they? Which they use, like you know, I can't what really they call it, but it's like a there's like a separate section where you put the comments. So if you're used to seeing comments at the bottom and you add the comments and see what people have said, you get to the bottom of an article on the, on the BBC site and there's nothing there. Have your say. That's the one, isn't it? There's a have your say section on the website. So people are used to working in one way and then suddenly the BBC website works in a different way and that can cause a, a, dis a disjoint. And finally, what's the attitude to what you're, towards what you're designing? Is it something that's central to their lives? Words, are they going to be there all the time? Are they going to be constantly on there checking for updates? If that's the case, have some form of feed which they can link to, which they, they can get the updates without having to go to the site. Or have it so it remembers where they got to on the, on the comments or the, the section and when they go back onto the page, it returns them to where they finished. Things to make their life a bit easier. If it's something that's just occasional bit of fun, then obviously you wouldn't need that functionality. Is it the same people coming back over and over again to the, to the site? 
Or are you getting, going to be getting lots of different people approaching your site? Is there a core user group? Yeah? So what can you do to tailor to that core user group? Have you come across the term gamification? Gamification? It's where you attach game elements to non-game environments. So for example, things like leaderboards. Um, you know when you have forums, it says so many po how many posts people have, have posted next to their avatar. That's an example of gamification, where there's almost like a little scoreboard going on, where people are competing against each other. Classic example of gamification, um, GIFGAF. Have you come across GIFGAF? Yeah, yeah it's, it's really clever. It's, it, it, it embeds <coughs> gamification in... Basically, it's, it's a, a network based, based on O2, and you get points by answering other people's questions. But you don't get points, you get credit for your phone by answering people's questions. And people rate you on the answers, and that determines what, how, many, how, much credit, how much credit you get. And there's leaderboards of who's got the most credit, who's answered the most questions, who's got the most credit on their phone. And the, if, you, if you get a chance, look at GIFGAF, because it, they've taken gamification and they've really run with it and employed almost every strategy in the book to make a really engaging site. Ah, good interface. OK. <coughs> We all know what a bad interface looks like, don't we? We've all seen bad design and bad interfaces. So in a way, it's much easier to think about what makes a bad design. So there's three areas which make good design. So let's think about the opposite. So the first feature of a bad design will be inefficiency. It takes you lots of clicks to do what you need to do. And if you go back to the first third slide, when we talked about the uh, what people expect to do, what's their core purpose of visiting your website, if you make that path really difficult for people and make it really complicated or bury it somewhere in a submenu on the site, it's going to be inefficient. If you've got a huge long forum which people are reading and they want to keep coming back, when they come back, don't send them to the top of the forum because then they've got to scroll down to the, where they've got to and they've got to remember which post they read. Return them to where they were before. <coughs> Second feature of a, of a rubbish interface is it's difficult to use. It could be a visual issue. It could be trying to find the navigation elements on the page, trying to find out what they should be doing. It might be as simple as the thing's buried so deep, you don't know where to look. Or it could be something, if you think about, if you're working designing a website for a desktop environment, if you rely on rollovers with your design, what's going to cause problems for, the, for users? Touchscreen. Touch screen. There's no such thing as a rollover on the touchscreen, is there? You can't roll your finger over without touching the screen, and then you made a click. So if you rely on rollovers to highlight parts of the site as you move over it, people on tablets are going to lose all that. It's gone. Um, if you start using Flash, and that, that is a capital offence on this module, then you've suddenly lost all your tablet users and phone users. Yeah, They can't access the site. If you rely on graphics to communicate navigation and someone's got graphics switched off or they're on a slow connection and the graphics haven't downloaded, they can't navigate your site. So you've got to think about how easy the site is to use. And when we start the second assignment work, we're going to talk about the structure of your code, of your HTML and your CSS, and the purpose of each. And if you very care, when you think about it and you separate out these issues, it becomes very easy to design. Final one is, is, is the site counterintuitive? So when you, do, do people click on the wrong thing? Are the labels misleading so they go to the wrong section of the site? I think the classic example is the student uh, intranet here. Have you ever tried to find any document on, that student intranet, on your student intranet? Have you used it recently? Have you tried to access anything on there? It's almost impossible to find what you're looking for. Uh, I had some tier four students, supervision students over the summer, and they had to print off a single piece of paper to come to the sessions. Not one single student could find it on the student intranet. And you go to the admin staff and they say, well, it's obviously under, then you go to this menu, then you find this link which doesn't make any sense, you click on there, and the fourth link down, which also doesn't make any sense, that's where the document is, obviously. Yeah, the sort of site you need to have intensive training before you can use it. And that intranet's are really good examples of rubbish website design. Because unfortunately, the content structure is designed by non-designers, isn't it? They've got this lovely you know, SharePoint system, and you're giving admin people authority to put things in different sections and create different headings. 
Yeah, for them it's obvious, for us it's not quite so obvious. Visual design, we're going to get onto the visuals, how the site looks, how it comes across. Okay, you don't have to have big black glasses to do this, by the way. Yeah, I've even taught computer scientists to produce good website design. It's a bit more of a challenge, but we, we do get there in the end. It's tricky, but it's not impossible. It's something which you acquire by practice. And that's the key here. The more you do something, the better you get at it. And what we do, I'm going to give you some rules. And now, obviously, if you're an expert designer, you feel free to break the rules. Yeah? If you're really good, you can break things. Just like if you look at some of the classic films, I mean, Tarantino is a classic. There's certain rules of cinematography, and Tarantino probably breaks every single one of them in his films. But that's because he's good. Yeah? And he knows how to convey things. Now, the lab is going to be mainly paper and pen this week. You won't need to use the computers very much. I want you to use what's up here and not what's down here. Okay, because generally as soon as you touch the keyboard, your brain starts to go into neutral and you go into autopilot and you start to, you don't really think creatively. So in the lab this week, it's going to involve, involve flip chart sheets and, and marker pens and just really thinking things through. Now, this is where you can practice. Look around you. This is what graphic designers do all the time. They look at things, they look at the posters. If you look at Ellen, uh, Ellen Terry building, there's always posters at the front there. And look at them with a critical eye. What do you like about them? Yeah, what doesn't work? Is there a problem with the spacing? I mean, I, I'm, one of my failings, I'm obsessed with typography, fonts. And I'll change things and remove one pixel from between two lines because it doesn't quite look right. Yeah, graphic wise, I'm not quite, you know, I'm not as, I'm not as obsessive like that, but when it comes to fonts, just mental note there when you do your websites. When it comes to fonts and typography, kerning, leading, um, anti-aliasing, the font shapes, the, the, uh, the tails, the headers, it's all, it all fits together to form a beautiful design. But if you like a design, whether it's the colors, whether it's the um, typography, whether it's the graphics, sometimes it's the white space. It's not what's on there, it's not what's, what's missing. Some of the best designs, there's more white space around the, th the objects than there is object. And we look at a classic one, the, the uh, Dropbox homepage, I think it's about 10% graphics and 90% just blue, just plain. There's a, there's a white line drawing in the middle of it, and the rest of it, apart from the little login box, is completely empty. Now, you've got to be really critical. If you like something, and say it could be packaging, yeah, it could be, you know, when you get your fast food out of the, you know, out of the freezer to cook it, have a look at the packaging. Look at the colour schemes. Colours convey different meanings. So if you have packaging using browns and greens, it's going to give you a different impression from reds and blues, isn't it? You find very few food packages in blue, for instance. Think about it. Very little blues, blues used in food packaging. And you don't know why. Mine's blue a bit of a no-no when it comes to food. It goes back to dispensaries and hospitals and chemicals. What comes in blue bottles? Bleach. <laughs> yeah, poison. The old-fashioned dispensaries, all the poisons were in ribbed blue <coughs> bottles. They were blue so you could see it was poison. They were ribbed so when you, if you were blind, you picked it up, you knew it was, it was dangerous and they had this ribbon on the glass. Blue is a no-no colour. Last time you ate any food that was blue. Hmm? But they're not really blue, are they? <laughs> Good thought though, I like, I like your attitude. So, there's almost no blue food out there, is there? And blue is associated with, associated with poison. So we tend to avoid blue. I mean, for example, I hate Morrison's. Nothing to do with the food, it's to do with the colour scheme. I hate it. Sainsbury's, I've, I've, I've disliked initially. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of getting used to the oranges, the oranges and the sort of maroons colours. Tesco is bright colours, but Morrison's is green and yellow. I don't know what, it's just a, maybe it's just a sort of, you know, gut, gut reaction to it, but you have to be constantly critical of, I mean, when they designed this, doing the purple seats, there was a conscious decision to put purple chairs in here. I think it just hid the stains better and the, and the uh, chocolate. <coughs> but everything is done for a purpose. 
Okay, if you really want to get into it in a serious way, this is an excellent book. The visual novice means the noob, okay? If you're completely new to this, it's not a particularly expensive book. And if you go to the website, there's loads of free stuff on there. I love typography.com. You see, I, I like this site. Because I like typography with lead type, with chunks of lead, with letters carved into them in, in, the, in the printing presses. And that's how I got my love of typography. For you guys, it's going to be a little bit different. You can design whole logos just using fonts, can't you? You can, you can really go to town and really work with the way the letters fit together. So ilovetypography.com is a very, very good resource for learning about visual design. The non-designers design book says it all, doesn't it? And it assumes no prior knowledge of, of uh, graphic design. But don't just read a book. Mess, play, try things out, sketch things down, look at layouts, you know, pen and paper. If you've got one of these little sort of moleskin style notebooks, just sketch loads of ideas in there. Thoughts that come to you. But one of the tasks you've got for this week's lab, I want you to do a mood board. Have you come across a mood board? No. Mood board, I'll talk about those a bit later. It's the idea of just getting your gut feelings together on a piece of, on a, on a piece of paper. And mood boards can be huge and occupying a whole wall. And you just find pictures and fabric and, and graphics and cut them out and stick them in. Yeah, and just get an idea of what works for you, colour and graphic wise. Practice, 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 eventually you'll get good. Right, design principles. There's lots of them, I've got five. And this is what separates the complete noob, noob from someone who knows what they're doing. Okay, you work with these five principles and you can't go far wrong with your website design. And the first one is contrast. Good website design has contrast. I'm not talking about garish colors, I'm talking about contrast of soft and sharp, contrast of colors, contrast of textures. You'd have a nice texture background and have a foreground plane in the same color and it looks really effective. So contrast, contrast, contrast between elements on the screen. The next one is balance. And again, you'll, you will get obsessed in Photoshop. You'll, you'll have a graphic image, the banner, you'll have your content there, and you'll be tweaking it by pixels. And you'll stand back and look at it, and you'll go back in, you'll, you'll have a cup of coffee, you'll come back, you'll tweak it a bit more, and you'll get absolutely obsessed with balance. Balance means you've got a balance of, um, if you've got an image on one side, you might have a weight of text on the other side. Have you come across text density, the concept of text density before? Text density? Come across that? The idea is, imagine you screw your eyes up and look at a piece of text on the screen. The darker it looks, the more dense the text is. It's the ratio between the amount of white background and the amount of black text. Anyone got an iPhone? iOS 7. If you look at the home screen, the text density is almost nil. You've got these really fine graphics, a fine text, haven't you? And lots of space around it. If you look at a, a, a broadsheet newspaper, like the Times or the Independent, you look at the home page, it's text, 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 lots and lots of text, not much space around it. So if you've got a graphic on one side and some text on the other side, you almost got to squint and look at it and say, is it balanced? Is it like a seesaw? Is there too much weight on this side, too, too much weight on that side? And try and get the balance right, make the image bigger, uh, space the text out a bit, improve the line spacing. Between, between, between lines and just get it perfect. <coughs> Alignment. Okay, worst case scenario, Comic Sans, 40 points centered. It's a crap font. The spacing is terrible. Centered makes it hard to read. Um, so alignment, you have left aligned, you have right aligned, you have justified, you have centered. They all serve a purpose. I mean, at the moment, my, I quite enjoy left aligned headings. It's just probably a phase I'm going through at the moment. But I like to keep things left aligned with kind of feathered. If you left aligned, you see, you get this kind of feathered edge, don't you, to the right hand side of the graphic. And if you've got margins on your page, you've got to be really careful for balance. Because if you have the same margin on both sides, what's going to happen to the, to the balance? You get white space because you've got white space on the feathered edge, you have to reduce your margin on that side to make it look <coughs> right. You see what I mean? because you've got lots of white space because you've got this feathering effect. Whereas the other side, you've got this hard edge running down the side. So you, you stand back and it's just a visual tweaking, just trying to get it right. 
And in next week's lecture, I'm going to do probably a whole, almost the whole lecture will be demo using Photoshop. And I'll show you some of the tricks and techniques we can use for Photoshop. Repetition, columns, logos, graphics, buttons, links. Repetition is a very strong emotion. It's a very strong motif for your website. So if you've got some tabs on the top, nice repetition of tabs, you've got paragraphs, you've got cut, call, call outs, you know, really text, okay? It's a ry rhythm, it's the rhythm of your website is shown through this repetition. And the last one is the most important. You're not designing a newspaper. White space doesn't cost you anything. It costs smartphone users something because white space requires more battery power than black. It requires more battery power to, to generate a white pixel than it does a black pixel. So the only sufferers are going to be people on smartphones. Okay? And they'll lose their, their battery will drain faster. But as far as your design goes, embrace white space. Have loads of it on the page. Use it to arrange things. Don't put borders around things, just put a little bit of space between elements. That's all it takes. Less is more. Every time. And then next week, we're going to start with a blank canvas. I'm going to bring a sketch in. Or I might just be very brave and nick a sketch off someone in the audience from their website design. And we'll actually have a live session and we'll sit down with Photoshop and build the user interface and build a graphic mock-up of the website and see how we get on, learn some techniques along the way. And then what we're going to do is we're going to slice and dice. And slice and dice, slicing basically means you produce your whole web page in Photoshop and then you use what's called a slice tool, which is like a little knife tool, and you chop the elements out you need. So for example, you might need a banner to put in your website. <coughs> you might need the background of one of the buttons, which you can nine, nine slice, come across nine slicing. So yeah, you can have a treat next week. Nine slicing. You can take any button image and make big and small buttons from the same graphics. And we do the same when you've got, caught, when you've got fancy borders around blocks. We slice the image up in such a way that we can stretch certain bits of it to fit around the, around the shapes. And then we're going to, in the second assignment, we're going to use a web editor with HTML and CSS, and we're going to combine it all back together again into a website. Okay, Gestalt laws. First point is to be able, be able to say Gestalt. Gestalt is how the human brain works. It's how the human, human brain perceives things. Because when you look at something, you're not really looking at it. Your eyes are absorbing photons, which are hitting the back of the retina, which have been turned into electrical signals. Your eye sees things upside down. Then the brain has to rotate what it sees by 180 degrees and rebuild the image. What you see isn't what's there sometimes. You've seen you know, these trick images where you see different things in the same image. That's an example of Gestalt. <coughs> <coughs> So there's two important Gestalt laws we need to think about in our website. Proximity, if two things are close together,